thank you for the ability that we have to worship you. God, when we call for your fire to come and fall on us, God, we're asking for your cleansing. Biblically, Lord, when you burned things up, you burned away what was impure. We want to be your people, shining bright in this world for your glory, not to be seen as good, but that you would be seen as good through us to a world who needs you, Lord. And our confession is we need you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, you can have a seat this morning. Uh, Rob, Sean, Patrick, thank you so much for being here this morning, leading us in worship. We're grateful for you guys. So a couple real quick announcements. I'm just going to run through them. We got breakfast here next week. So if you want to come around 815 uh, show up. If you don't show up for breakfast, what's going to happen is say that you forget this really quick announcement and you show up at your regular time. Then you have to smell breakfast in your hungry stomach because we know you didn't eat before you ran out the door and it's just going to, you know, it's going to be a bummer of a morning. So get here, 815. You can put that in your phone to remind you next week we're going to have breakfast uh, in the fellowship hall right before the service. And uh, also next week, we're looking forward to welcoming Ben Davitt as an elder here. So he's still kind of in that waiting period. And if you'd like to talk with him about uh, what that means for him, if you'd like to talk with the leadership, we'd love to chat with you about why we would consider Ben David as an elder. And then also the Log Cabin Day Parade is coming up on September 24th. We've got a sign-up sheet out there just because we want to have a general idea how many people um, are going to be there and what vehicle you may want to bring. You can bring your own vehicle, or if you don't have one that you want to have in the parade, you can jump in with some of us. We've got motorcycles, old cars, golf carts, you name it. We're going to have fun. Do you guys like having fun? Yes. Who doesn't like having fun? We're going to represent the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in the parade and this church, and I think it's just going to be kind of a fun way for the community to be aware of who we are and what we're up to out here. So, um, 21 years ago today, I was in college, and I remember uh, I was in my dorm room when a friend of mine, another college friend, stormed in the door and started telling us, I remember he yelled based generally at the top of his lungs, we're under attack, we're under attack. And me and my other roommate were sitting there and like, what are you, what are you talking about? For those of us that uh, were alive 21 years ago, we know exactly what I'm talking about, don't we? Every one of us in the room that was alive, because I know that some of us are younger that aren't 21 years old, we don't remember that. You weren't born yet. But for every one of us uh, that was old enough, we remember exactly where we were, we remember exactly what we were doing, and we remember exactly that feeling that we had when we got the news that the Trade Center had been attacked, and um, that the nation essentially was under attack. The Pentagon was hit, and um, we were, in effect, under attack. And just that feeling, it was like, what are you, what are you talking about? And turning on the news and feeling like there was an attack on our mainland. And so um, we think about and we consider uh, the, the lives lost. We consider the sacrifices made after that event what it means for us that so many soldiers were activated into deployment. I was talking with one this morning. And just how life changed here in the United States. And we got a couple of folks in the front row with never forget shirts. And, and the, it's, it's the truth. When you live through an event that sh changes the world, you, you don't forget what that is. And so uh, we remember the September 11, 2001 uh, attacks today. And um, we'll continue to pray for those families and pray for our nation as we continue to Figure out what it means moving forward, knowing that there are entities that are constantly against the freedoms and the liberty that is set up by the United States Constitution and also our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, uh, whether we believe that America is a Christian nation or not, you know, other countries think that we are. And they think that the way America acts is how Christians act. And the things that America does in and around the world and in our own nation, that that just must be what Christians are. And it's like somebody says, this is bad. We need to represent the Lord Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Today we are kicking off a brand new series in 1 Timothy. 
in 1 Timothy. So you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy, and we're going to uh, learn what 1 Timothy is all about. I'm really excited for this series. Pastor Jeff and I have been building into this quite a bit, and um, I want to start with a little bit of an illustration as you get to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. I've got in my hand an instruction manual. Instructions. Now, I know some of you guys are like, what, what's that? <laughs> what's an instruction manual? And you ask yourself the question, well, what are instruction manuals for? It, this is an instruction manual for our portable, our sound uh, speakers that we have set up over there. And so this is an instruction manual for a couple of speakers that we project the sound out into the overflow area. And I just wanted to show you for speakers, this is how big the instruction manual is. But I'm going to ask an actual question of, of you guys this morning, and you could just kind of shout out a general response. Different people have a different response, I'm sure. Literally, what is an instruction manual for? Trash. <laughs> Throw it away. First, res- that was too quick, by the way. Too quick. <laughs> what is it for? Tell you how to operate it. Guide you. What else? How to put it together. How to put it together in the back. How to not fail. Like you don't want to ha- be on a fail video. You, you, you follow the instruction manual. And we get them with everything we get, right? Even if it's a tiny little piece of paper. Or it's like this is how you use this. This is how you effectively put it together. This is how it ought to operate. If you do your part right. Right? Instruction manual. First Timothy, as we look into this book, a lot of people call uh, the Bible an instruction manual for life. And that's really, that is true in a lot of ways. It is the, the revealed glory of God himself in creation and through his people. And it is an instruction manual that teaches us how to live. But specifically, First Timothy is what you call a pastoral epistle. I'm going to jump in. We'll read First Timothy 1, uh, verse 1, and we'll just kind of jump in. It says this, Paul an apostle, if you like underlining things, you can underline that right there, of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. The introductory to this book is just like you would expect from any of the books kind of written in this time frame, any letter that would be written, whether it's a, a Christian letter from uh, Paul to another individual, Timothy. This is just the structure that you would use in the Roman Empire if you were going to write a letter to someone else. It's just a very classic entry and opening. It says, Paul, he introduces us to the author of the letter. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. You can underline that part as well. We ought to ask ourselves, who is Paul? And I'll be brief with this. And then who is Timothy? <clears throat> God was starting churches. What's the context of 1 Timothy? God was starting churches, brand new churches. The gospel's going out throughout the world, and these people are talking about this man who rose from death, Jesus Christ, and there's this stir, and all these religious leaders thought they knew exactly what God was like and what it meant to follow him and what it meant to spread his gospel, and yet now there's a new group of people that are on the scene, and they're running around saying, dude, you guys are missing the key, the linchpin to the entire thing, that God came in the flesh that God died, that he was resurrected from death, that he shed his blood for us, that we are now perfect sacrifices for him because of what he did for us when we give our life to him. And there was the Holy Spirit and the gospel going throughout all the known world. <clears throat> and this guy, Paul, who was a persecutor of the church, right, has this vision of Jesus, Saul of Tarsus. He gets, he gets knocked down off of his horse, as they say, his donkey, He has this vision, and his life has changed. And he starts writing letters to different groups of people around the Mediterranean and around this ancient world to tell them and to instruct them what to do, how to live, what this means. First and second Timothy are what you call pastoral epistles, and so is Titus. There was three of them. Pastoral epistles. It's a pastoral letter. So say that with me. Ready? Say pastoral letter. 
That's what these three are, First and Second Timothy, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And what they are do, meant to do is instruct young pastors in how to lead their churches. That's what we're reading. That's what God has given to us in these pastoral letters. They're instruction letters to young pastors. It's a leadership manual for the church. It was written around A.D. 62, and this was one of the last letters written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote Titus after this. He wrote 2 Timothy after that. So 2 Timothy is the last letter of the Apostle Paul. I want you, when we jump into this, to think of Paul as older and experienced. He had done all three missionary journeys at this point in his life. He had traveled over 10,000 miles, most of which by foot, some of which by boat, bringing the gospel all over, going to these little cells of Christians all over this ancient world and instructing them. And now in his life, as he's older, he focuses all of his attention to what he considers as an elder man, to be the most significant, important thing that is happening. And that is these churches and these young leaders. This is <clears throat> now, as we look back at it, we call them pastoral letters. His last three letters were to pastors to say, guys, you've got to hold the course. You've got to dig in. He has seen prison times, several occasions. He's seen several different prisons. He's been in company with the lowliest of people in society, and he's held the company with the highest authorities that the land had to offer. He'd been beaten and left for dead <clears throat> on several occasions, praised and celebrated all the same. Isn't that strange how polarizing this man was when he'd show up into town? It's like, we're either going to kill you, or we're going to bring you into the city center and just let you speak and let you preach and do your thing. His chief concern was for the success of the church of God. And so his final letters were the signif of main significance to us because they were so significant to him. Verse 2 says, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Who is Timothy? The name Timothy, if you're taking notes, means one who honors God. That's the meaning of Timothy's name. He had a Greek father and a Jewish mother. And so in his culture, that would have been a little, a little bit weird. It was a little bit polarizing inside of the family. And so his, his Jewish mother and grandmother heard, no doubt, this gospel that was going around, and it says that they had great faith. So you can imagine that they were Jewish women. They understood the Old Testament. They understood very well what was going on with God's plan of redemption. And when they heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, whoa, God actually came. He actually fulfilled his covenant promises to us. They were transformed. And if you look at where it was that Timothy lived, you can see in Paul's missionary journeys, if we got out the geek maps and see where he went and all those city names that we jump over when we read through the scripture, it's like, oh, here's his first missionary journey. He went right through where Timothy grew up. And they responded. And Timothy responded with faith. And then the next time Paul comes through, the scripture tells us, uh, you can put it in your notes if you want, he's talking about in Acts 16, 1 through 5, is the first mention of Timothy, and he's known as a faithful young man. He's probably in his late teens, early 20s, and immediately gets called by Paul to follow him all over. So Timothy did. He, he follows Paul around the ancient world, watching and witnessing the beatings, right? Witnessing Paul gets thrown in prison for preaching, and so then it's Timothy coming up to the prison cells or being that inter intermediary between like, hey, we need to get him some food because it's not like they had an awesome meal program in an ancient prison. This is Timothy. Timothy's mentioned by Paul in several letters, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Paul sent Timothy to the churches in Corinth and Philippi and Ephesus as his hands and feet. You need to go there because I can't. I wanted to take a minute for us to get to know Timothy because so many of us, I think, as Christians are familiar with Paul. And we hear of Timothy, and we know there's two letters in the New Testament that bear his name, but we don't really think about who he was. And the more I looked into Timothy, this is what I would say confidently to you. If you know Paul, you know Timothy. Timothy is like young Paul. A lot of times we, we call him the protege. And sometimes when we think about protege, we get the wrong image because we think about 
oh, this like little guy who was kind of timid or shy or quiet. I don't want you to think that anymore about Timothy. I want you to think about a man who is followed in the footsteps of a giant who followed him for 15 years all over the ancient world who was willing to go into new territories as Paul says, hey, go over here and straighten out the church there. And he goes into an area where there's these entrenched elder Jewish leaders who think they know exactly what's going on. And this young guy needs to come up and say, you're dead wrong. Think of what that meant. And we look at verses about, you know, don't let anybody look down upon you for your youth, which is in 1 Timothy. We'll get there. He was in his mid-30s when Paul wrote that to him. What he's talking about is, I know it's hard when you walk up to these leaders and you tell them what's up. You're going to do it anyways. And I know this culture greatly respects their age, and you ought to respect their age as well. But you have the truth, and nothing can silence that. Paul calls Timothy my true child in the faith. Timothy was proven. He was like miniature Paul. When you meet Timothy, you meet Paul. The first point is this. Who's your spiritual parent? How do you reflect their faith? Who is your Timothy? You think about this relationship and the introductory to this book, and it says Paul. Paul's saying, hey, Paul is writing a letter to Timothy. We get to have this correspondence. We're dropping in on their email or their instant messenger, right? We're literally looking at what Paul says. Hey, we're setting up churches. God is doing his thing, and it's amazing. I'm getting later on in years, and you know that Paul, he starts, if we get into 2 Timothy, you can see Paul is like seeing the end of his life. He's like, dude, my nine lives are running out. I'm about to go home. And we get to jump in and see what it is that he has to say to this Timothy. Who's your spiritual parent? Who led you to the faith? What was it that happened in your life that caused you to consider Jesus Christ the Lord? Who are those pivotal relationships that you had? And even it, it may not be anywhere as close as a Paul and a Timothy that lasted for years and years and years. It may be nothing like that. But that person that you looked up to, for some of us, I want to say unfortunately, but this is how God works sometimes. For some of us, it's like a podcast or something that we've listened to for years and followed someone. And we feel like we've gotten to know them. And in many ways, they have mentored us. And that, that's a good thing. But who is it? And and. What do they hold significant and dear that you ought to hold significant and dear? Those pivotal people in your life, those faith-filled people. When you reflect on their faith, some of us, we may have had somebody really pivotal in our life, and then later on, a decade later, years and years later, they fell away from the faith. And we think, man, this was the pitfall that they had in their life that I want to make sure I don't fall into. God guard it and guard me from that. How do you reflect their faith? What was it in them that you'd say, these are the main key character attributes that I love so much about them? We ought to ask God that we would reflect those things, right? If it was a thing that impacted our life, maybe we would use those same character attributes to impact others. God, do it for your glory. And who is your Timothy? Do you have anyone in your life whatsoever that you are thinking, I am trying to pass this faith along into them? I think for many of us, we, we do it haphazardly. We do it extremely casu- casually. We don't think of maybe anyone in our life as a Timothy. And I think we do that to our own shame and peril. We think, I'm not a Paul, so I can't have a Timothy. We must pass it along, amen? We're going to pass it along. You can say, I don't know much, but this is one thing I know. You could take a young, anyone, anyone under your wing and say, hey, man, I'll tell you one thing. I made all these mistakes, right? <laughs> I made all these mistakes, but this is one thing I know. The Lord, this is what the Lord has taught me. And we can pass it along. Critical. Critical. Who is your spiritual parent? Let's continue on. Verse 3. Verse 3 through 4. As I urged you upon my departure, this is Paul again writing to Timothy, I urge you upon my departure for Macedonia. Remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than the furthering of the administration of the gospel 
or of God, which is by faith. Paul tells Timothy to stay in Ephesus. He says, stay in the town right there uh, and, and continue to minister. Paul had kind of set it up. He'd gotten it going. He'd stayed there several years. Paul left and told Timothy, stay on there in Ephesus. Ephesus is an interesting town, interesting city. Um, you can look it up, you know, online. You can see all kinds of things about ancient Ephesus today. It was a uh, a major hub for all roads and commerce for the Roman Empire, running into Asia Minor. So there was all kinds of things. They had a seaport there, but then they also had an awesome road system that was going in there. And so it was a bustling place. One of the seven ancient wonders of the world was in Ephesus, the Temple of Artemis, sometimes called the Temple of Diana. It was a 400 by 200 foot structure with 127 60 foot columns. If you saw a picture of it, I didn't throw one up here, but it looks like it, it would have looked like one of those, you know, large Roman structures where it's just pillars all the way around the outside and kind of a peaked roof. And it was a modern wonder of the ancient world. Think of 127 60 foot pillars holding this roof up. But it was a tribute to none other than a false pagan god. And when people would come into there, you know, that, that alone brought commerce and all kinds of things coming and going out of Ephesus. In the letter of Ephesians, Paul makes no condemnation to the church. When we read Ephesians, Ephesians was written to the city of Ephesus, to the church there. And if you read Ephesians, the interesting thing is Paul doesn't have any correction for the church there. Most of his letters you read and it's like, hey, this is what you're doing wrong. You need to do this instead. And that helps us as well. But in Ephesians, if we were to read the book of Ephesians, it's all about our identity in Christ. Well, why did he write like that? Because the church was functioning very well. He had been there for several years making the thing, you know, making it work very, very well. And eventually what, what he, when he writes the letter, he's like, you guys are rocking and rolling. This is what it means to live in Jesus. This is what it means to be a Christian, a follower of God. This is what it means to have armor. You know, he says, he says walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He's just exhorting them, keep going, keep going. But now, in 1 Timothy, later on, years down the road, as Timothy is instructing there, he says, hey, false teachers are in. There are false teachers in your midst. There is some wicked, evil, mean, and nasty stuff going on inside the church. Verse 3 says, instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. The Ephesian false teachers had worked their way into positions of leadership. It says not to teach strange doctrines. These were elders. These were like elders in the church, and it, you know, this, their city churches were constructed a little bit different than ours because we have all independent, kind of autonomous churches, that many of which, some of which believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we operate autonomously and, and independently. But in Ephesus, this would be like a hub, and then you would have all these different groups that are kind of meeting, and you had leaders, elders, that were dead wrong. Two of which are mentioned at the end of this chapter, uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul says, I confronted them and I handed them over to Satan. <laughs> it's like, okay, was Paul gentle with this? No. Did he beat around the bush and say, hey guys, you know, I kind of thought that maybe you guys would just, you know, there's some things, let's just, we got to talk. He's like, hey, this is what's going on. You're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. He's not handling non-believers, he is dealing with teachers and leaders inside of the church. Why is false teaching such a big deal? I was thinking about this. Why is it such a big deal? Imagine that you had a classroom and you have a teacher in a classroom. We can just imagine a school classroom just like any other. And you have a teacher at the front and you have 20 students there. And they're all showing up and if there's any teachers here, you're like, this has never happened. They're, they're sitting there and they are looking and they are ready to learn. And the false teacher comes in and just starts in teaching the pupils lies. And they just reciprocate it and reciprocate it, right? They just keep, hey, we're going to have a test today. And the test is on all the lies that I told you. And the kids all take the test and they're all, they get 100% on the test because they believe the lies of the false teacher. And then they go out of the classroom and what do they do? They perpetuate the lies. Hey, this is what I've been learning from my teacher. You say, oh, newsflash, that's a false teacher. <laughs> what you are learning is lies, and it ain't good. 
we think that it would be tragic for a teacher to propagate falsehood about history, right? That would be bad. Or English grammar, tragic, right? Math. What about if it's the nature of God himself? This is what your God is like. And everything comes out, you're like, "Uh uh-oh, whoa, 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 it's not that at all. Strange doctrines. Do we have any strange doctrines today? Floating around? God would never send anyone to hell. It's a strange doctrine, isn't it? We're like, whoa, 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 pump the brakes, pump the brakes. Sometimes it comes out like this. My God would never send anyone to hell. Introduce me to your God. Who, what is, tell me more. Because he's not this God. This God talked about hell when Jesus came to earth more than anything else. More than anyone else that talked about hell was Jesus. Why? He just sang, fire, come down, purify us, Lord. He says, you're sinful people and you're hurting others. It's like uh, our God is righteous and just and he has provided anyone who wants an escape from hell, a pathway out, and you don't even have to work for it. It's like, oh, well, that's the good news, right? You don't need to go to church, just be a good person. Or like, well, wait a second, part of that, well, you don't really need to go to church, and going to church doesn't save you, but just be a good person. Well, that's impossible. (laughs) I know me, right? Like, there's false doctrines, friends. There's been false teachers. It's been happening for a long time. Ever since the beginning of the church, before the church age, there was false teachers. It's just what we have to deal with, and that's okay, and we shouldn't tremble, and, you know, we don't need to punch anybody in the face, but it's, we can address it. We don't have to be worried about it, but when you don't address false teaching, what happens? The 20 pupils become 20 teachers. And that's how it goes. Here's one more as we're having fun with this. All religions are basically the same. Dude, all religions are basically the same. Oh, you're a Christian? That's cool. I just think it's crazy how all religions are basically the same. Like, uh, uh, uh. no. Hindus have a caste system. These guys are better than these guys. You were born into that family? Ugh. You are worth more. You are worth less. You have bad karma. You will be born back as a dog because you did bad things in this life. Right? Oh, you were in that, you, you're in poverty? That's because you did something wrong in a last, past life. You better figure that out. Do better next time. That's the caste system. All oh, religions, they're basically the same. Islam, five pillars of Islam, works. Don't know if you're going to get to heaven until you get there. It's a big maybe. But at minimum, you do the five pillars right, at a minimum. And if you can't do that, well, Buddhism, enlightenment, nirvana, zen. If you could just find peace now and and think rightly, get all the terrible stuff, you definitely can't have like Facebook and find zen. That ain't going to happen. No cell phones, right? (laughs) Like, I don't know. They're like, no, no, that's a, cell phones are okay. But that's Buddhism, eliminating desires. If I just get less of myself, I'll find a peace and an inner calm. Guys, are these the same? Uh, it, just bur- it just burdens me like crazy. No, man, God created you. God created us man and female, male and female. God created us in his image. God loved us with an everlasting love. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. You aren't going to do it just right. He is going to provide a way for you to have salvation. Anyone can get to heaven when you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is unique. This is earth-shattering news. This is something different. Let us never relegate it down into the cesspool of all the other religions, of everyone clamoring to get to the top. It's the same as everything else. Christianity is wholly different. I got a bunch of other stuff here. They're myths. Jesus and Satan were brothers. 
all these other extra biblical books, the Gospel of Thomas and Judas and aliens in the Bible. And it's like, guys, Paul says, don't put your effort into this. Don't think about it. Just set it aside. Address the gospel. Address the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, right? The faith that we need to put in him. All this speculation. Verse 3, I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia to remain in Ephesus. I'll jump down to verse 4. These give rise to mere speculation. All these endless genealogies and strange doctrines give rise to speculation rather than the furthering of the administration of God, which is by faith. If you're taking notes, this won't be on the screen, but you can put false teachers promote empty speculation. And God's plan is by faith. You follow the false teachers, all they're going to do is break, it's not going to lead you to stability, right? Because it's a lie. A lie is by its very nature, wayward. False teachers promote empty speculation. God's plan is by faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God will give you faith, not as a result of works so that no one can boast. God's plan is a saving faith, a foundational faith in him, a power to save, a faith in Jesus Christ the Lord who is our hope, as I said. A great exchange, he took our sin, he gave us his righteousness. Jesus took upon himself our sin and he said, you can be a son of God, you can be a daughter of God. That's a deal. It's like, oh, I didn't do something wrong in my past life. I don't have to work anything off. Believe by faith. We could just roll on this all day. We'll just get to the point. How have false teachers influenced you? Where is your faith in something other than God? See, empty speculations have no power to save You could believe all the false teachers and you could do everything that they say just right and there is no power to save. Paul gets to the goal now, verse five. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. Here's the question, why do we teach? What do we as Christians present to others? What is it that we actually offer this world? The goal of our instruction is love. If you're looking for a a verse to memorize this week, that's it. 1 Timothy chapter one, verse five. The goal of our instruction is love. Have you ran into a church or a Christian who's missed this? I'd say me personally at times. Oh, the goal of the church is financial gain. Jets, gold chairs, fancy clothes. Right? Power, political influence, building a kingdom, just not God's. When the motive gets off, the goal changes. (laughs) When the motive gets off, when your heart is off, the goal changes. And all over, look at what he's saying, from a pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith. Our culture right now is so radically confused on this word love. And I would almost bet that some of us in the room, when when Pastor Ben gets up and says, the goal of our instruction is love, you almost can roll your eyes and you're like, oh, brother, sounds so floaty in the sky, so roses, it's just so nice. And it is nice, and we ought to love, but when you use Bible words, you got to use Bible definitions for those words. So our culture says love is love. I'm not going to be a big jerk about it. I'm just here to tell you that's not even a definition. Like that doesn't work, right? Like any English, any grammar person would be like that. Wait, that, lo- that doesn't, you can't define a word with a word that just doesn't even work. Love is love. Is love. Or love is whatever you want it to be. Again, we're in the, am I off here? It's kind of like crickets out there, but it's like, you can't define love as love. That doesn't work. So you have to have a definition, and the culture doesn't want to put a definition on it, because what? Then you're putting guide rail, guidelines up, right? You're saying this is love, and that is not. Uh, uh-oh. 
they don't want to offend or whatever it is, the motivation is. I don't even know, but here's the thing. The Bible has given the best definition of love that the world has ever seen. And I'm saying that as a Christian man with a huge bias, but I will challenge you to find a better one anywhere else. 1 Corinthians 13, it's called the love chapter. We'll just grab a section of it. Love is patient. Well, there you go. Now we're starting, right? You're not being patient. You're not being loving. Okay. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It is not boastful. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in Hmm. Definition. You looking for one? Man, the Bible's awesome, isn't it? God just dishing it out. Our goal is to introduce people to this love. This is it. And the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Paul is leading people to Jesus Christ, and he is doing it by introducing them to his great love. And he is saying the second that you get off course from that, your motivations are going to shift. If you just want to be right, you're going to puff up, and you're going to be arrogant and proud. He's like, no, don't do any of that. A definition of love, it's a biblical definition of love. There are so many other things. First John 4, 8 says, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And we go, oh, love is love and God is love, and we don't even know what that means. It's like, uh-uh, no, God is love. He is this. He is patient with us. He is kind. He doesn't. I'm like, oh, okay. And he rejoices in the truth. And so if you're living your life as a lie and you're not doing anything that he would desire you to do, he's like, he doesn't rejoice in that. When we live by God's definition of love, we're going to have some upset people because it's not going to look like shrug, love is love. It's not going to look like that. It's going to be like, dude, I'm not rejoicing in, with you in that. Love doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in the truth. What? You don't love me. I do. And I have a definition of it, and I don't do it right all the time. But I know one who loved me. And I could tell you about him. And that's where we go, from a pure heart, because the motivations matter, from a good conscience. I'll just wrap it up. Look at the, the end of the section where we're going, verses 1 through 7. It says, wanting to be teachers of the law. These guys have strayed aside from it and wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters by which they make confident assertions. This is our culture. Say it loud like you know what you're talking about, and people will listen, right? I'm sure if you make the post in all caps, then you're right. Like, no. No. Just this verse is, for whatever reason, has been a verse that's come up so many times in my life in the back of my head wanting to make uh, confident, making confident assertions about that which they don't understand. That's what always rolls in my head, making confident assertions about that which they don't understand. God is like this. You, man, you seem pretty confident about that, but that is not right at all. And my heart breaks for that. But you're going to live your life thinking God is like that? You're going to tell your kids that? Mm -mm. No, this is our culture. Revelation 2.2, I want to jump ahead to that. Paul charged Timothy to address these false teachers. So Revelation comes, it's at the back of the Bible, but systematically it also does come last, one of the last books written by Paul. Um, I'm sorry, one of the last books written by the Apostle John. He says this, and he brings up Ephesus. So as we wrap up here, what we're looking at is you got Timothy is charged to root out false teachers. That's what he's charged to do. All the apostles are martyred. They're all dead except for John. John writes the Revelation as a very old man, and, this, and he sees this vision, and God has a message to the churches. One of those churches is Ephesus, the, the church that we're studying, right? That First Timothy was leading, that Timothy was leading. It says this in Revelation 2, verse 2, I know your deeds, 
and your toil and perseverance, that you can't, cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. Did they root out the false apostles? Yeah. The false teaching, did they hold it to the course? They did. They did. And you have perseverance and you have endured for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. God's saying, I saw what you guys did, man. You held to the course. You were preaching the truth. It was right. You were right. Verse four, but this I have against you, that you left your first love. That you left your first love. This is a balance for us, right, in America as Christians, just in my own, like, heart and soul. If I see somebody doing wrong and they're talking wrong about God, I want to get out the two by four. Like, I, I do. There's something in me that just goes, and they did that. And they rooted out the false teachers, and they, they, they won the day for that. <laughs> but can you imagine Jesus looking you in the face and saying, dude, Dude, you held it like you held it. But you forgot about me. You forgot about loving me. The goal of our instruction. Where's the manual at? No, no, no. The goal of our instruction is love. Love is love? No. No, love is patient and is kind. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices in the truth. And this is what the Christian gospel is. This is what the Christians are doing. This is what we're all about. Have you kept Jesus your first love? How could you share with others what he's done? As I just wrap it up, I'm thinking this, man. I had talked to somebody earlier this week, two people, and we were talking about Jesus, and it was awesome, and it got to the point, and we were, we were Christians in the room, and it was like, where would you be without Jesus Christ in your life? Where would you be? Where would your hope be? How would you act? No, Jesus, all you're like, well, Ben, I don't do it just right all the time, and I'm not very perfect, and I don't know. Yeah, but honestly, just say, where would you be without him? He wasn't in your life. People are living that life, man. The goal of our instruction is love. We're going to introduce them to love. God is love. Love isn't God. God is love. He has a great heart for his people. Let's praise him as we wrap up 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Lord Jesus, we love you because you first loved us, your word says in John. You first loved us. You saw us in our condition. You saw us as false teachers walking around confidently asserting that which we do not know. And we were making disciples of that. And in your great love with which you loved us, you met us right there and you showed us how wrong we were. Thank you. Forgive us, Lord, for how we've sinned and we continue to do wrong, Lord, we know that. But we rejoice because we will see you face to face because you have promised that we will when we place our faith in you. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus. Our faith is in you. We're not building a house on sand that shifts. <laughs> Lord, if there's anyone here today that just needs to give their life over to you, God, I pray that they would do it. I really do. And whatever that means, for them to understand that they have done wrong and that you, Lord, will receive them when they give their sin over to you, repent and turn. Live a new life filled with the Holy Spirit, doing it in a new way because you make us new. Thank you, Jesus. What a joy-filled message we have today. In First Timothy, thank you for the instruction. Thank you that we can praise you. We look forward to the week ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church family. Have a great week. <clears throat>